recorded because Little Pond TV is down. I'm not 100% sure. So uh, before we get started, I'm just going to read the evacuation policy for any new faces. Um, so, oh, oh yes, it's being recorded on the iPad. Okay. So if you hear the um, fire alarm go off, uh, just please stay put and one of us will find out what's going on, whether it be with the radio or the phone. We will provide you instructions. Uh, and as always, those that can leave here without the assistance of another person, go ahead and leave first. For those that do need assistance or have an assistive device, you can follow out afterwards. Um, and we will instruct you as to where to go. So that's the evacuation policy. Uh, I'm Michelle Grimolia, the President and CEO here at Woodland Pond, for those that don't know me. And uh, we're going to do our um, management Q&A today. I'm going to let you guys start so that you can introduce Tanya, and then you can do your dining update, and then you can give it to whoever you want next. Just make sure you introduce yourself, everybody, okay? Hello, everyone. Okay, I'm Amy McIntyre, the Director of Dining. It's so good to see so many faces here. Hopefully it'll be double the amount next month. Right, because that's the whole idea of getting us all out here. Okay, just quickly, um, a lot of the faces already know, but this is my new dining room manager. This is Tanya Greenger. Tanya's in her. Yeah, we got her. Um, for anyone who's watching the recording, please come and say hello to Tanya in our dining room. That would be amazing. But I just wanted to make sure you saw the face and to know that we have someone. We also have Ruth. You guys all know Ruth, the hostess. I've also promoted her, and Ruth is going to be supporting Tanya in the dining room, just keeping the young um, wait staff that we have accountable. And I'm super excited. They've been doing a great job. The two of them are like a power team. All right, perfect. Thank you, guys. Okay, I just have a cook some quick updates. Um, I want you to know that we have the new spring summer menus coming out. Um, they're going to be brought to the May 3rd Dining Committee meeting. I'm just going to let the Dining Committee see them, give them a little bit of an approval, and that following week we will be starting the new spring-summer menus. You'll have, it'll be a new five-week cycle. Um, some of the old items, people have been coming to me. I know that um, Cornish Hen is going to be on the menu because that was asked. I know that um, liver and onions was something that somebody wanted back. Spaghetti and meatballs, believe it or not, it's either you love it or hate it when it comes to liver and onions. It just, there's no in between on that. There is no in between when it comes to something like that. Um, I also um, was talked about a few luxury items that would like to have a return, so we're looking into that. I mean, as is right now, we do a, um, just give you, we do a beef tenderloin filet. You know, guys, you know that, it's in our cycle. But somebody asked for a prime rib, so why not do prime rib? Those kind of things are easy. I'm gonna price out some other items. Just know that there's gonna be a price difference on the menu, but if you wanna see something, dining director, okay, at Woodland Ponds, you can email me and let me know. The menus are not out, so if there was any old favorites that you've missed, let me know. And that's the idea of cycling out the menu every, you know, different seasons, is because now come fall, you're gonna miss some of the items that we have now. And then we'll bring them back for fall. Okay, so just be patient with us, menus are coming. Bistro is going to be open for lunch. I'm looking at May 9th, Monday, May 9th. That is the, yes, Michelle approved lunch menu today. Yeah, we'll bring that to the dining committee so you guys can check it out too. But lunch is happening. Um, we also are gonna start doing barbecues. I just went over to the health center and I know that they're gonna start barbecues. They do it outside in the pub for lunches, so I'll be doing the health center barbecues in the pub starting the 24th, um, but then I'm gonna get you guys some dates too, so we can have some fun barbecues also. Um, mm -hmm. um, something was brought up to me, so I just like to mention it on groups like this, better communication with special menus and events. So Passover just passed, and I worked with quite a few residents to make the menu. I gave them exactly what they wanted, We discuss it in great detail. So the disconnect was, is that it wasn't on a week at a glance. And it also was just posted at the host stand. So anyone who came and called to make their reservations, whether you call or you email or you come in person, if you asked about the Passover menu, 
Ruth or whoever was at the desk had that education for you. But it was brought to my attention that they wanted a next step. So um, now for any kind of special menus, special events, you will get them in an email. Um, I am on the SUSCOM committee and they don't really want me to put it in every cubby. Sorry, I'll just email. But email's enough, okay? But I'm also working with Jason, congratulations Jason. But the connected living boards that you have in the main halls. Dining is going to, there's a huge overhaul for dining. You know when you hit the button now, it doesn't say anything? Well that's, that's within the next month or so, you're gonna see a whole new dining. You're gonna see daily menus every day. Um, weekly specials. So Jason and I have been working for the past, next, past couple weeks. So that's all coming. That's all the updates that I have. Does anyone have any questions for me? Yes. If we call to make reservations, is it the policy, if we leave a message, is it the policy that we should be answered by telephone confirming the reservation? Meaning if you, if you call and leave a voicemail, then you would expect a call back to confirm the message. Are you setting me up right now? Yes. I, I can tell. I've been doing this a long time. So did a situation happen for you specifically where you did not get a call back and the best? Okay, so I can talk to them at the desk. So the answer is absolutely. So if you're gonna call and leave a voicemail, we all wanna call back to confirm the, the reservation. And at this point, we're not getting confirmation. Are they just, I'm assuming, I know Monday morning we walk in and there's 20 voicemails at least, and about 50 emails. So by the time I think that they're putting them in, but I will tell them that you want just a confirmation call back. That's no big deal. Anyone else? Oh, it was brought to my attention that there's a lot of no-shows for the reservations, okay? This is happening on a, every evening. We are having people who are not showing up for their reservations. Um, it was brought to my attention because there's other people who have wanted to maybe make a reservation and they couldn't. We don't really have that going on anymore, but it still was brought to my attention. So instead of, I'm not gonna, I don't overreact, but I am going to react. So I now have Ruth and Tanya trending that. And you know, if it's a one-off and you forget or something happened or you weren't confirmed and you didn't show up, we're not gonna, we're not gonna even talk about it. But I'm gonna see if there's any patterns of behavior with certain, you know, residents not showing up, and then I'll sit down with Michelle and we'll talk about how we're gonna handle that. But I, that was brought to my attention by more than one resident, and that's the only reason I'm bringing it up now, that I'm gonna be more aware of that. There's a huge difference between a one-off and a pattern of behavior, and um, I'll, I'll look into that for you. Yes, I'm there. Hang on. Hold on, I I just wanted to comment in the positive that the brunches for the vegans have been great the last three weeks, and I really know that you've been working on it, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, slow and steady, just we understand. I'm in my two months now, so slow and steady. You know, Ina had come to me about some different eggless eggs, some different variations on vegan dishes. We've had some pluses, and we've had some fails. Um, we do have an apple strudel vegan ice cream right now that's outstanding. I know somebody wants a mint chip, but I can't find it. But we're getting there. Any kind of request, you can just email me as Ina does when we work together. Hi, Amy. Um, I want to thank you and your kitchen staff uh, for working with uh, myself and, and Hannah Brooke on the Passover uh, meal that you provided uh, Friday and Saturday night. Unfortunately, I was not here for those evenings but I heard from several uh, residents that the meal was very tasty, and I'm looking forward to, I know it's a year in advance, but uh, I would like to, which I, I participated in and helped organize with Ronnie, a Passover meal, uh, at least a table of settings uh, showing the various uh, traditional foods on, uh, uh, on the plate. Okay, you'll yeah. hear about it. Let's do it. That. What's but. exciting for me is that you're coming to me about these kind of things. Because when I first got here, it was like, can I just have hot food? Right. You know, so when you're coming to me about these, I can't wait, I'm excited. We did a mock Seder over at the health center. That's happening, yeah, so that's happening this afternoon, I think. So Marin is already there, the activity, so I would love that for next year, absolutely. Anyone else? Ooh, I like it. I'm 
Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Leonard, the Resident Services Director, and I work closely with Gretchen Dunn, the Activities Coordinator, Mary Jo and Angel, the Wellness Nurses, and Grace, the Fitness Coordinator. So today I just have a, a couple of um, activity announcements for you. We have a lot going on this month. We have a lot happening for Earth Day this month. So please take a close look at your calendar and also see the incredible display outside the dining room that was put together by the Sustainability Com um, Committee. And um, so it's really great that our calendar is, um, is full again. I feel like we're really back to, um, back to what we were prior to COVID and it feels really great to see everybody out and see everybody active. And on Saturday, April 30th at two o'clock here in the pack, we have a really special piano recital. That should be a really incredible performance. And so take a look in the newsletter for a description of that. And if you wish to attend that, we're encouraging everyone to sign up at the concierge desk as we are expecting a, um, a full house for that event. And as always, if you have questions about the lifestyle here, activities, if you have concerns about how you're doing, physically, emotionally, anything like that, if you have concerns about how the neighbor is doing. So many of you come to me or call me and we just talk about what's happening with you or you're concerned about a neighbor and that's what I'm here for and I'm happy to spend that time with you. And so please just feel free to just stop by my office or give me a phone, give me a phone call and we'll talk. Michelle, do you have anything else that um, you'd like me to touch on? Do you want to just mention a little bit about the rough game plan for when baby comes? Yes. So, <laughs> so baby is not expected until May 21st. So we still have a ways to go. And I'm feeling really good. Everything's going really smoothly. So I'm really excited. And um, Cameron is going to be uh, sitting at my desk while I'm away from maternity leave for about 12 weeks. And um, so we're gonna be uh, meeting more often as that time gets closer and putting together our plan. And of course, Mary Jo and Gretchen will uh, be here as well. So hopefully Angel will be back soon. And um, yeah. I had said that hopefully Angel will be back soon, but we don't, we're not sure, you know. She had an injury, yeah. She's been out for a few weeks. So, and I'll be obviously assisting Cameron. Um, we'll work together. Everything will get taken care of. There's no problem there. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anyone have any questions or anything for me? Becca? Thanks very much. I mean, I appreciate a lot I mean, the, what they have done in support of the sustainability activities, particularly the Fourier Day. I want just to remind people that on Saturday uh, at 11 in the morning, 11 to 3, we will have the first repair cafe here at Woodland Pond internally for both the residents and staff. And we already got one of the staff to volunteer to do some repairs. I got some coordination with Tom, with, with uh, Rob, and you know, Cameron, and so on and so forth. And we look forward to uh, successful things. So if you have things that are, don't mean you king size bed to fix it. I mean, just, you know, just things that you can carry. And, uh, and the other thing is, I mean, all the activities for the sustainability, for the uh, celebrations of Earth Day are on a calendar. I mean, there are things going on all week. And thanks, Michelle, in particular, to facilitate the staff to volunteer to do uh, some of the repairs. Hi, I'm Philip Mayo. I'm the director of the health center, I'm social worker and licensed nursing home administrator. And I want to point out my tissue here. I am not a fancy person at all, and I randomly stuffed a tissue in my shirt before, and look how it turned out. So, I mean, I could not have folded a handkerchief in better shape than this. So, uh, I, I wanted to call attention because it may never happen again. But, uh, uh, so I just want to um, uh, give you some updates on the health center. I'm often not sure, uh, there's so much going on at all times, and so I try to kind of cherry pick some things because some folks over here may not um, know a lot about the flurry of activity that does go on on a daily basis. 
Um, one thing that uh, is very, very good news from any way you look at it and the results of collective hard work from uh, many, many people in this room and over in the health center is we have been on a hiring frenzy. And those two words are not often heard together in uh, healthcare staffing. Uh, and I can't promise it will last, but we uh, have hired um, several people uh, of various capacities and, and um, licensures um, to uh, bulk up our staffing in the health center, which is the want and desire of every healthcare facility in the country. Um, so we're doing well in that area, all the things that we're doing in terms of recruitment, all the things that we're doing in terms of retention. Um, of course, orientation will vary as uh, people are at different stages, um, but the good news is um, people are coming in, so I just wanted to pass along that good news. Um, additionally, uh, in just sitting here, when I came early and, and um, taking in these types of events that we have here to keep you all notified uh, of things going on and give the opportunity for discourse, the Health Center also possesses such forums. Um, we do have, um, Resident councils for all levels of care in the health center. Um, they are facilitated largely by Marin in the activities department, who is a masterful facilitator. Um, and uh, that is a good opportunity for residents to um, be able to verbalize just as here, what they feel is going well, what they feel is not going well, and then to expect some um, responses and updates on things. Additionally, I see Ted over there, the health center committee. Uh, which uh, many of you may be on, and I know Ted's always looking for new members. Um, that is also an important committee uh, in bridging um, uh, independent living folks uh, with the world of the health center in terms of helping to support programming, coming up with ideas, problem solving, etc. Uh, so these forums do exist. Um, I'm sure Ted won't mind me saying, uh, uh, stop and see him today if you have any interest in that. Um, I am also available to give tours in the health center, uh, either me or um, a member of my staff. Um, uh, I, so if anyone does have an interest, they just want to come over, they want to be walked around and ask some questions and see what's going on, shoot me an email, give me a call, we'll make sure that happens for you. Anybody have any questions? Anyone want to know how to fold a handkerchief? <laughs> Tom Tango, Director of Planning Operations. Um, a couple things, and then I'll take questions. Um, one thing I want to mention, and it's been mentioned to me by the fire inspector also, walkers, power chairs, things like that, if we could not, if we, could, we need to pay attention to where we leave them. Like, we could, I mean, we're going to try to be a little more diligent about letting people know, like, like not by the front entrance, not in the hallways. Um, if you have a question about where they should go, you know, ask us, we can ask concierge, but we, we want them to not be, like sometimes we can get a number of them like backed up by the front entrance. And that's where emergency services comes in. And they mentioned that to us already. So we want to be, we want to be focused on that. Again, if you have any questions, ask me or ask concierge. Um, a lot of you can smell. We are painting the, we painted the hot tub, the, the spa today. Um, we're gonna, then Monday we'll put a second coat on it, and then a week from then we'll fill it up. And then that should be good for a couple more years. Um, the grass, they're here today, cutting the grass. It got pretty long pretty quick. Then they were gonna come the other day, then it snowed, so they got here today, so. And I know they were pretty busy in their yard. They put the, the grass equipment, and they had to put the snow equipment on, and the grass equipment back, so, you know, they're here to that. Um, the other thing, I have two openings for maintenance tech twos, and we're not getting any apps. So, like, if, if, if everybody here, if you're aware of your friends, or neighbors, or family, or you just need somebody at a traffic light, um, you know, we have openings for maintenance tech. So if you're aware of anybody looking for a job, encourage them to put an app in. If anybody has any questions, ask me. I have a question. Yes. Do they have to be super qualified? Or in other words, do they have to be licensed in anything? No, they do not need to be licensed in anything. Um, but maintenance tech two, as opposed to maintenance tech one, 
maintenance tech two is a skilled position. So they need to come in with you know some type of skill in in the trades. Um, but I would encourage anybody who even thinks that they are qualified to talk to me. And you know, let's see what you know, let's see what we can do. Um, other than yeah. What's the big machine doing in the woods? What? Uh, I wasn't going to say any questions. <laughs> um, the, the excavator, the backfill is in the woods today. They're digging some test pits for the, the we need to know before we start building the, the three additional uh, duplexes. And what, they're, what they're doing right now is they're digging the holes so that they know what the compaction is, and how tight the dirt is packed, so we know how tight to pack the rest of the dirt. So that, and they'll only be there today. We're not, we're not doing it right now. We're not, we, the work is not commencing, no. That work is only part of the, the engineers that are there, not the contractors. What's the normal day of the week for the grass cutting? Like, I mean, last season it was Thursday, and today's Wednesday. So when can he we doesn't spend? know. He doesn't know yet. Um, the, the contract that we have with him, it doesn't specify that it has to be cut once a week. The contract specifies that the grass be no less than two and a half inches, no taller than three and a half inches, and, and at any one pass, take no more than one third of the blade off, one third of the distance off. Do I measure the grass? No. Um, but I mean, it's in theory, generally comes once a week, yeah. Last year was Thursday, probably going to be Thursday again, but he's not ready to confirm that. Tom, I live on the fifth floor, and I'm wondering what the uh, time schedule is for finishing our corner. It's almost done. Yes, it's almost done. Right, uh, but uh, the, uh, the furniture still needs to be put back yep. in place, and it needs a really thorough cleaning, as yes. you probably are aware. Yep, yeah. Uh, I'm, it's the, the painters, are, they're supposed to come back tomorrow, I believe, but uh, I don't have an exact date for you now, when, but it's progressing. Yeah. And we'll clean it up once they're finished. Right. Oh, Rob, I have to tell you, fifth floor, once we finish it. <laughs> Got it. Thank you for communicating that to me. Yeah, good. <laughs> Anything else? You mentioned the mobility devices. Right. There has been a time when they were required to be removed from the dining room. We put that out recently as a requirement. It is not happening. Um, and we had some discussion with the dining committee about that. And there's probably not room in that little room near the OSTA stand for all of the um, no mobility devices that are now in use. When we had to put them in that little room, there were quite a few less, um, a smaller number. Right. So maybe we could look again at what to do with mobility devices in the dining room. Hi, Betsy. So, yes, we can do training with the staff on that. Um, we have. We okay, we'll do more. I mean, because so we talked about this at dining committee. You weren't, you weren't there. But the same people 12 to 13 years ago came in without mobility devices. So those same people, they now have those devices. We didn't even think about that when we were making these new decisions. So that room where we also have Suscom with the recyclable will not fit all the mobility yeah. devices. Actually, that's... We, yeah. Yeah, we, we can talk about it later. But. We just need to we need to clear the room out, yeah. and we need to make sure there, there needs to be more education that happens. Number one, we need to clear the room, but there is actually a distinction. We're only seating a third of the people we were seating in each seating okay. now, so there just needs to be a different process. They can definitely all fit. It's just the transition between the different seatings that we have to figure out. Um, but at the end of the day, there cannot be any walkers or mobility devices in the dining room. So collectively between the residents and the staff and us, we have to get much more diligent about this. Um, it's the same thing in the card room and the meeting rooms and everything. We cannot have walkers and mobility devices at the card tables and at you know the men's coffee. These things have to be against the walls uh, or in the appropriate areas because they are a huge trip hazard. Um, we are just a matter of time away from having a catastrophic fall like we've had in the past where somebody trips. Uh, we all have to be better about it in all locations. So we are gonna take the lead on making that more of a priority. 
So there have been some um, Yeah, that's all right. There, there's been some um, public invites for uh, assisted living people to attend some meals, some of the kinds of special events. To not have assisted devices is not an option for some of them. So how should they proceed? So we, it's the same. It's the same process for everyone. Everyone that needs an assistive device, we assume actually needs it. So they are seated at the table, and the staff brings them to the cart room, and then brings them back at the end of the meal. Um, for those that can, what we really prefer is that you bring your cane attached to your walker with the clip, and, and all of you that have the walker and the cane should have both. If you don't have the clip, we can order some more and get them into Dedrix, and then walk to the table with your cane. But if you can't do that, we remove the device for you, and then we bring it back. But we'll do probably a memo on this and do repeat um, education on it. And we're really going to need everybody's cooperation because someone is going to trip, and whether it's a staff member or a, uh, a resident. We've had very serious injuries happen as a result of this in the past, and the way it is right now, it's going to happen again if we don't all work on it together. And I'm also going to say, when it gets when it gets to the point where the fire chief and the, is mentioning it to me, like once it gets on his radar, then when he starts coming here, they're going to start paying attention to it. So it behooves us to solve the problem ourselves before he solves it for us. And one of the things that is, is more challenging to discuss, but I'm not afraid to say it, is I know that there are people that are bringing a walker just to carry their takeout back. Because it's easier. It's true. There are definitely people here, um, and not necessarily in this room, but there are residents that have become very accustomed to using their wheeled device as a cart or in lieu of a bag or something and I think we need to look at ourselves and say does this make the most sense you know if we have a limitation on space if you're bringing your walker strictly so that you can put your takeout on it and wheel it back we could probably find you a better solution for the bag or something um, so we'll work on all that but we all need to get back to just recognizing that these things are Although an assistive device for some, they're also a risk to the community in terms of a trip hazard and also obstructing safe, you know, pass through for emergency responders. And also the motorized mobility devices. Yes, that also. all of that, and definitely. My staff's not comfortable, so we'll talk about all that. Yes, yep. Yes, thanks, Betsy. Um, who else has something for Tom? All right. Okay, thank you, Tom. Rob. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Dunn, Director of Environmental Services. A couple things I wanted to touch on. One mainly, uh, Carrie had the baby Saturday. Yay. So, healthy baby boy named Hudson. There are so, pictures of both Jason and Carrie's babies at the concierge oh. with their names. So, if you haven't seen them yet today, go ahead and take a look. Yeah, very cute. Yeah. yeah, very cute. Um, so, what we've done is April is now, we'll be helping us with a lot of Carrie's functions, whether it's, you know, scheduling and other stuff. So, if you can't get a hold of me, you can still call Carrie's phone number, and that's already forwarded to April's phone. So, if you need to make a change in your housekeeping schedule, or if you need something from, from me or, or for April, like, just give us a call. So, that's, that is all transitioned over. So, um, Carrie was very good at knowing who's in what room number. So, we're, we're struggling with that a little bit in the office. Who's in what room? But if you ask Carrie, she had it like that. Um, so just kind of bear with us. So it'll take us a couple of weeks to get the wheels moving a little faster. Um, I have noticed a couple of pest control issues that are creeping up now, now that it's warmer and it's wet. Uh, if you have those issues, please contact concierge uh, first thing. Uh, put your name in the book, and there's a pest control book, and then uh, Marcus from Craig Thomas will come visit you. Um, a lot of times what we're finding is he will come on a scheduled day, they schedule the day, we do not. Usually it's every two weeks or twice a month, uh, and it's every other week. Um, you might not be home at that time. Um, so if you have that type of situation where you know you have a pest control issue, and you call me as well, so I can let Marcus in if you want me to address that if you're not gonna be home, okay? So uh, I wanna take care of the issue sooner rather than later and address all the issues when he is here. Is there a set day that he comes each week? No, like, for a while there, he was coming on Mondays, 
Uh, and this particular week, it's on Thursdays. His office does the schedule. We really have no control over that. I just know it's it's twice a month, every month, and then it's every two weeks. So, but if you have a specific emergency problem and you've got 400 bees on your back porch, don't call country. That's when you're going to call me, and we'll come take it or something more serious right away. Um, but if it's something little that we can just put in the pest control book. Because I find a lot of times pest control is here and then I get the phone call the next day. You know, so if it's not, you know, if it's serious, I can have them come back at any time. So don't feel like if you feel like you want it addressed, we can bring them back and we can fit them in the schedule and they'll just do like a one about on that. So now's the time, especially in, you know, cottages, we're seeing some increasing, especially with the amount of rain that we've had in this last April and March. You'll start to see those critters coming. So keep the food away, keep it off the counters. You know, keep your areas clean of fruit and stuff. So, okay. Uh, any questions for me? Go ahead. Miss. Go ahead. I have tiny, tiny little. Looks like a worm, but it's minute. Only in the bathroom, and only occasionally. So you might come three times, and I don't have it. I've never seen them before. They don't bite me or anything. I'm not afraid of them, but I went to to pick it up and realized that it was a living, a living thing. But I've never seen what they are. I have to we could have pest control determine, you know, what it is, or we can sometimes we can I can figure that out depending on, you know, I have a little app that will identify the book for us if I'm not sure what it is either. Because I can't make an appointment. <laughs> right, right, yeah. No, we don't care the bug schedule. It's your schedule that's, you know, more important. Um, but those are things that we, he can address too. So he can look at maybe what the source is. And a lot of the creatures that live around here, you, I mean, you all know you live in the middle of the woods. You know what I mean? So we're never going to be 100% pest free. But it's just a matter of maintaining it, make sure thing, things are sealed up, that fruit is put away, that there's no water leaking. Sometimes these critters are just drawn to the moisture, so that's why they're in the bathrooms. Um, and it's dark. A lot of the times the bathroom lights are on. That's the kind of the environment they're looking for. But well, are you in the pest control book now? Okay. Well, will be now. You will be now. And we'll make a visit. We'll probably see you Thursday. And if, and if you're not home, then we can, if it's okay with you and you sign that form, then I can bring him in. We'll never send him in by himself. It'll be me or April with him. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Rob, do you have plans to resume the annual cleaning? And, yes. And the second part is when can we expect window washing? Window washing usually takes place. I just got the email from the window washing vendor, I would say a couple weeks ago, for us to schedule that. I think mostly we've done that in July or August. We wait for the pollen to pass by. Because if we do the windows now, come pollen time, your windows are going to be green anyway. So that's the time that the, the window washing company recommends is usually end of June to somewhere in August, depending where we can fall in that schedule. Um, and then the, you know, the health center, I'll talk to you about, about them coming in if you want to do that this year. I know some residents have want to do that, if that's something you want to address, but yes. The annual things we will getting back to, um, Carrie and I were working on a plan and putting things, because basically everybody needs to get it done, um, and how we're going to tackle that. We might start with smaller apartments first and work our way up, because it's been years pretty much for everybody just due to COVID, that everybody is behind at this point, and then just having the staff in place to go ahead and, and tackle that. So as we ramp up on the staff and get them into place, we might start with the smaller apartments so we can knock them out of the way. If we only have two housekeepers on that day, we can do that as well. You know, so, but yeah, I'll call people with the schedule and feel free to call me, you know what I mean? And what day works best for you and we'll work out a schedule. Just wait for the mic, it's coming. Thanks, Tom. You can expect, the, uh, you can skip the apartments that have been flooded, because they've been rather thoroughly flooded. Yes, thank you, Tom, for that as well. Okay, the third, yeah, the ones that have been flooded have been thoroughly cleaned, so you're welcome. <laughs> Way up here, Tom, front row. What is included in the annual cleaning? 
We hammer that in. The annual cleaning is more, you know, where we're pulling furniture out of the walls and moving things that we don't normally move. We're not gonna pull your couch out on a regular cleaning. You know, so if we need to pull that away from the wall uh, or move furniture that we can actually move in the apartment, obviously we're not gonna move a big credenza with a bunch of china in it, but you know, we, we, we just do a lot more detail on the bigger things that we're not getting to on a bi basis. And there is a checklist. Yes, there is a checklist. I can put that in your mailbox so you can have it and take a look at it. Any other questions for me? All right, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Hi everybody, I'm Bridget Blum, Director of Human Resources, and I just wanted to let you know that on May 5th, we are going to have, in this room right here, a blood drive. Uh, we are sponsoring an American Red Cross blood drive. It is open to the community at large, so we've already had some folks from the community go onto the website and uh, select a blood donation slot. Um, we've also got some employees who've signed up, but I just wanted to let you know that that's going to be happening. Um, if you are eligible to donate and are interested, you could uh, come see me and we can schedule an appointment. Uh, I know the Red Cross would be very thankful. Blood supplies are at an all-time shortage. Um, and you know the nice thing about this particular blood drive in American Red Cross is that they have contracts with all of the local area hospitals. And so when they take the blood here, it goes, it you know gets cleaned and, and they do what they do with processing the blood, but it comes back to hospitals in this area. Um, they're not able to tell us exactly which hospitals, but they have confirmed that they have contracts with all of our local hospitals. So we know that the blood that we're collecting does make its way back to our community. So, um, so the age restriction was a question. The unfortunately, the the gal that I'm working with at the American Red Cross is still unable to confirm for me whether it's 74 or 76 by their policy. Um, but certainly, if you are eligible to donate and are not, we'll go with 74 to be safe. If you are not um, under age 74 but over age 74, you can still donate with the doctor's note. So, you know, you, you can have permission from your physician um, and donate if, you, if you'd like to. Okay, any questions? All right, thank you. Thanks, Bridget. Um, one of the things that I found rather appealing about the idea of donating blood was that um, I had heard on Spectrum that right now the American Red Cross, for all of the donations that they're getting, they're actually testing for COVID antibodies, and then you will get the report. So I'm, I'm curious. I haven't, to my knowledge, had COVID, but I'd be curious if I have the antibodies. So I was going to donate anyway, um, but this is a nice way for me to find that out, just for cu curiosity reasons. Thank you very much for arranging that. Um, some of you may not remember, but we used to do multiple blood drives here per year. We would do them in the health center in the great room. And uh, we were, you know, get, generate a decent amount of blood donations. So certainly it's it's for staff, it's for residents, but it benefits the whole community and I'm glad that the community can come in as well. So hopefully we have a great turnout on that. Um, I don't have, oh, hold on, go ahead. How do you secure our facility when people are coming in from the community to give blood? So the question is, is how do we secure the, the facility or the community to the outside? So we're, we are an open community at all times anyway. Dedricks is a public location. Sawyer Savings Bank is a public location. Um, these are, are things that our community, we are an open community. We're not a gated community. We're not a closed community. It's the same process though as somebody coming to visit any of you, a delivery person. They still have to check in a concierge. We do the, the normal check-ins. They're directed to their location. We've never had any issues at all. Um, you know, it's not something that we've ever, you know, had any concerns about, but certainly the staff knows what to do if they have any concerns, they contact us. Um, but it's no, really no different than the Lifetime Learning Institute folks coming or, or others. So it is an open campus and until we have a need for it not to be, I think that suits us because we want to be a good community partner. Okay, and American Red Cross is still operating with full PPE and so forth in terms of their own precautions and stuff. Thanks, Bridget. Um, 
So for those of you that have asked, I'm doing pretty well. Um, you can see that I'm standing here. Thank you all of you for asking about how my health is going. Um, it's, it's good, we're good. I have one more procedure that I have to have, which will be in probably, I'm having trouble scheduling it, but I'll be out for a week uh, when I can fit it in, sometime between now and, I don't know, 2023. Uh, <laughs> but I'm doing good and I appreciate everybody's patience and I especially appreciate my team. Um, it's just great knowing that you can have a health situation and not have to worry about anything. It's an amazing team um, and amazing residents that have put our faith in us. So thank you to all of you for allowing me the time to deal with this issue without having to worry about what's upon it all. Um, you know, we've got a lot going on right now. As Sarah alluded to, uh, we've got an enormous amount of activity going on. We're having more and more trouble every day getting things booked into different rooms. Uh, you know, it's a little bit like playing chess for moving people around. It's a great problem to have. Um, we are going to be looking at, I think it was the last management Q&A or somewhere. I don't think you were here. Somebody had asked if we could start doing more things in the evening time, like scheduled activities more in the evening time. So once Jason gets back and, and we have some time to think about it with Gretchen, uh, oh, it was at the luncheon that we had for the developer. Uh, actually, Lionel Hyman brought it up and just said, you know, some of us are, you know, still up and at them, you know, after dinner, can we start doing some more things? So we're going to try to maybe spread some things out throughout the day, but any of you that has an interest in anything going on the calendar, please bring it to us. We want new ideas. We want fresh stuff. Um, you know, it, it's all good things. We uh, continue along with the expansion endeavors. Um, we are inching our way towards where we're going to be hopefully selecting a site contractor soon for the, the small on-site expansion of the six cottages, uh, and then uh, hopefully a builder and get the site plan approvals and stuff from the village planning board, but that's moving ahead. Uh, we are working with a developer from Texas. Uh, some of you participated um, in their tour and, and luncheon last week where they came and visited to kind of walk our canvas and then walk some adjacent property because we are looking at expansion opportunities. Um, you know, we want to understand what what choices may we have in the future, what's the feasibility of these things. This is not the kind of thing that we can do on our own by any means. This is, you know, higher level stuff and there are firms that just do this across the country, senior living development. So we know we have to refurbish and update this campus. Um, We've got lots of focus groups, lots of surveys that will be coming. We want everybody's feedback, but it's going to be a years-long process. So if you haven't had a chance to participate in that yet, you will. We want everybody's feedback. So that's all going to be kind of in the works. Um, we are, I, I'm in the process of continuing my search for a sustainability coordinator. Yesterday we had an excellent interview on site with a very qualified candidate, uh, but we are still, you know, keeping our, our, our um, options open for right now. Uh, we are going to continue along in this process with this specific candidate. He met with the, some of the members of the steering committee from the sustainability committee yesterday, um, some of my leadership team members, and that was a great interview. So we're, we're continuing along in that process. Uh, working with the residence council, quite a bit. So the Residence Council right now is, and Michelle Capovano is very motivated to make sure that she feels that the Residence Council is, is being as beneficial to the various committees and the residents as a whole. So you might see different kinds of conversations happening at the Residence Council meetings. You should attend those meetings if you can. Um, I think that they are intended to be on Channel 1340 typically now. Um, of course, right now we don't have 1340. And I'll explain where we are with that in just a second. It's on Zoom. They're on Zoom, but that goes through 1340. Right. So I'm sure we'll rec we might record it. I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. But um, so you should be trying to attend at least one residence council meeting or watch it on, on CCTV, the channel 1340, when you can. Because there's a lot of stuff that's going on at those resident council meetings. Um, and to that point also, I don't know if you're all aware of this, but all board minutes for the Woodland Pond Board, all committee minutes, and other very important information is all located for you in the library. 
So to the extent that you want to understand what, let's say, the Plant Ops Committee is working on, you can find those minutes in the library. You can find the Woodland Pond Board minutes. It's all open and accessible to you. So to the extent that you want that information, you can find it all there. Um, Betsy, to your question and, and la lamentation about the 1340, um, our Zoom stuff typically goes through 1340. It's the computer that's used. 1340 and the Zoom meetings are on the same computer. That computer went on the fritz two weeks ago. So we had to special order the replacement computer for, the, for our feed that does 1340. And like everything else, it's on a back order. So we're not sure when we're gonna get 1340 back up and running. We're hoping we will have the hardware in hand by April 30th. So we're looking at another probably two weeks. So what we're doing in the meantime is what we're doing now. So this, this is being recorded and then it'll be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, because it's being recorded. So I know that Connor and Marissa are doing a bit of that. It's not the ideal. It's really interesting to me how reliant we've actually become on 1340. Because now that we don't have it, everybody's noticing. So, uh, you know, it, it has really become a big part of how we communicate at Wilton Pond. So we know it's important for folks to get that back up and running. So we did ask them to expedite the shipping. Um, I don't think I have anything else that I wanted to add for right now. Does anybody have anything that they would like to say or ask of me? The residence council meetings are being opened by Zoom. Yes. So are you saying the Zoom doesn't work? Because I believe it does. So the Zoom meetings are working, but you can't watch it through 1340, which is how we usually air it. So I'm not sure what's happening this week. We'll find out for sure, and I'll get instructions out. I mean, the connection to to the council, the, the council meetings. Uh, so who people so attend via Zoom and in person? I understand that, but my understanding was is that that was being streamed on 1340 through Zoom. But if there's an invitation link for the meeting, we can send that out via email. Okay, so okay, so Jason's out on maternity right now or paternity, so we'll take care of that in his absence for Thursday. Uh, Michelle, we have a speaker coming next Wednesday to do a lecture with uh, illustrations. Uh, we had it set up that it would come from the computer to the screen. Is that still going to be possible? Sarah thinks it's going to be fine. Oh, okay. Is it the ones that are up? Is it, are the illustrations on the table? No, they're um, they're like slides, PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. Oh, PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That goes through the computer and doesn't require the 1340. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, PowerPoint is fine. Uh, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, you've got a project going. Uh, associated with looking at Woodland Pond out in the future. Yep. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? And uh, can you talk as to whether or not we'll have input into that process? And the other current problem is that many projects that we have on the table today really are on hold. I, some of them, we don't know if they're on hold or not. We really need to sort that out because we'll drive Tom crazy uh, trying to push our projects if, in fact, they're on hold. Right. So, uh, so I can speak to that. I'll speak to those questions in reverse. Um, I thought I put something in the chance of clear last week, but I'll elaborate on it a little bit. We are now at the point that we know that this campus needs a, a total redesign and refurbishment. What that means, we don't know yet. This is why we need to work with the developers and with the residents to understand what needs to be changed, what wants to be changed. Um, to that end, because we know that that very large project needs to happen in the next couple of years, we are now at the point that we are not going to be investing in anything that is a design or a decor or um, any kind of moving of walls or anything in the interim because there's going to be what's called a master redesign of the campus. 
Um, and that could include, you know, expanding certain rooms or modifying the use of a room, expanding garden space for the patio, um, obviously carpet, paint, furniture, all that stuff is in the scope of it. This is a, a very large project that has to happen because we're 13 years old. Uh, the campus is not necessarily suiting us for what we need. Um, and we know we have to do this, but this is not something that any of us can adequately direct or oversee. And in order to appropriately do this process, we need to use the specialists. And the specialists are these senior living development companies. They're, they're kind of all over the country. Uh, and there was a firm that originally did the development of Woodland Pond that no longer is in operations. Um, but there are plenty of others. And so we've selected the premier senior living developer out of Texas called Greystone. Um, they come with the best reputation. They have an expansive team. Um, we've seen a number of their successfully completed projects and they're just excellent. So they will help us figure out as a group, so this is not a management decision or a board decision or a resident decision, it's all of our decisions, what we need to do to bring Woodland Pond forward into the future to accommodate the needs of the existing residents, but also to look forward and say, what are future residents going to be looking for? We know that there's a greater emphasis on wellness, for example, than there was when the campus was originally designed. Um, we know that there's a greater emphasis on sustainability than when the campus was originally designed. We know that there are design problems. So for example, skilled nursing doesn't have any natural light except in the resident rooms. That's a huge design problem. The development firm looks at all of these things and says comprehensively, here's what we need to do to bring Woodland Pond to the next level. So as that process goes on, the first step right now is to, to, to determine feasibility. So how feasible is this project? We know we have to do it um, because if we don't stay current, we are going to lose your support. You're, you're going to not be willing to recommend Woodland Pond to your friends and family. You're not going to have faith that we're keeping up with things. So number one is to keep your support, but number two is to make sure that when Shannon is bringing in prospective residents, they're interested in coming to Woodland Pond and they don't want to see an old dated community that is not keeping up with the priorities of that next you know, generation of people that are coming in. So in order to accomplish that feasibility study, there's some initial steps that have to happen, and those steps are underway. There's data analysis. Uh, they came to the campus two Fridays ago, um, they, and while they were here, uh, we had offered if there were any residents that wanted to participate in the luncheon with the developers, they could sign up. We selected five residents, um, and then Dick Barry and Ray Smith were there as well uh, in their dual role as a resident being on the board. So there were seven or eight residents there all together. Um, they shared lunch with the development team. We toured the campus. We had extensive meetings with management and the board to talk about vision, challenges, opportunities. Um, and they sort of collected all of that initial data. They're gonna take all of that and kind of come back and say, here's what we think, here's what the Pond's wish list. Um, here's what we think it would take to accomplish this financially. Is there an opportunity for Woodland Pond to finance this and how would they do so? Um, so they have to kind of come back and, and crunch the numbers and look at everything and say, we know you have to do this, this is how it will get done. So as to how that's going to come out, I am not going to speculate. They are doing the work to determine that. Once we have that work back, which will be around June 1st, we will, as a board, as a leadership team, figure out, are we gonna proceed with this large scale redesign or do we have to try to scale this back? If we think we can do a big project, um, and then at that point is when we start collecting data from the residents, from the prospective residents or the people on the depositors list, from the staff and from the leadership team. And that's gonna be a combination of focus groups, committee input, residence council input, and surveys. So residents are gonna have opportunities to provide feedback four ways, through your committees, through the residence council, through focus groups, and through surveys. And all of those things will happen repeatedly throughout the process. So, you know, we'll have things that are specific to, you know, we'll have a focus group specifically related to meeting spaces. So if you're a resident that's interested in, you know, 
uh, we need better meeting spaces, you can attend that focus group. Or if you're a resident that's interested in dining options, you know, a redesign of our kitchen and offerings there and, and the dining room, you can attend that focus group. But these are all things that aren't gonna happen for probably six to nine to 12 months. And we can't do anything until we find out if any of this is feasible. Um, and we are also looking at possibilities of expanding our overall mission and product in, by acquiring adjacent land and potentially expanding further. Um, it's extremely common in senior living. That's one of the primary ways that on-campus renovations can happen is by expanding off-campus, growing your, your mission, doing more with what you have. But it all has to make sense. We have to make sure that there's enough dining capacity. What additional fitness space would you need? What transportation would you need? What's the economic impact? What's the environmental impact? It's a huge, huge process. Um, and again, it's nothing that we can do on our own. So it's very gradual. It's very basal. It's very common at this point, but it's, it's all in the spirit of Woodland Pond has now sort of reached our capacity in terms of what we can do successfully on the existing campus the way that it is now. We're kind of, we're kind of stuck. Um, and some of the challenges, for example, that Amy's team has, or the Tom's team has, Sarah, everybody's teams are now being challenged because our spaces are not designed the way that they should be. Like, if you look around this room, I mean, there's so much stuff in here that's just storage type stuff. You know, I mean, it's just simple things like that. It doesn't have a great amount of curb appeal when you come in here and see tables stacked in the back. And, you know, it's, it's looking at everything and saying the campus was designed for X 15 years ago. Now, where does the campus need to be? And then what does it need to be looking five, six, or seven years down the road? So there's a lot to it. But in the meantime, we really are not comfortable with investing dollars at this point that are going to be negated two or three years down the road as part of this repositioning project, right? So I wouldn't want to put a temporary carpet in here knowing that it's going to get ripped out in two or three years. It's the same thing as the project with the patio. So if you're a committee that has a large project that you're, you're looking to move forward and it's not a life safety problem or a regulatory problem, then it is going to be on hold. So you can stop bugging Tom because the answer is it's, it's, it's part, most likely that something like that, you know, are we putting in a tennis court? Don't ask yet because it's part of the, um, the master redesign. If it's something like, you know, what are we gonna do with the ponding on that pond? We do need to look at it. Also, I'd say, I've been saying for a while, anybody with questions about anything is more than welcome to come see me at one o'clock on Wednesdays, my office hour. I've been saying that for a long time, and in the last year I've had, you think, oh yeah, one. One person? One person. Um, so, you know, and I know like, you know, like Yakov always stops being a um, <laughs> you know, a lot of times I don't have the information you want. So like, like Ted, this question you have about certain specific projects, maybe the answer might be no to the project, but maybe there's ways we can solve something in the interim. So I would encourage anybody, you know, call concierge and make an appointment and come see me in my office hours. That's the best time because down there, I have that, you know, Noel is there, other people are there. I have access to put things. I don't walk around with a lot of information. So, you know, come down and see me. Stop that. I don't even think of uh, so Come down and see me at 1 o'clock on Wednesdays. Thank you. Yes, Annette? Uh, Rob's got a mic for you. Thank you. I have two questions. Okay. Um, one, has Greystone ever worked with a CCR the size of ours? We're among the smallest that they've worked with. I figured. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. they have worked with other small ones. There's a they've done, yeah, they've they done, do. yeah, they've done many single site, and the reason that they're most appealing to me is because they're currently completing a repositioning project at a CCRC that I have an enormous amount of respect for. Um, it's very similar to Wilden Pond on Long Island called Jefferson's Ferry, um, and they their team came very highly regarded, and I I respect and I have a great deal of respect for their CEO. He, like myself, is finance background, um, and he 
which means that basically he, he feels an, a great amount of responsibility to the residents to make sure that any resources that are being expended are doing being done so appropriately. Um, so spending wisely, I guess, is sort of where his head is. And he's getting a lot of bang for his buck with the team from Greystone because they do this a lot. So they've got a lot of people they can draw from. Okay, so my, my they're, they're excellent. My second question is, what is the size of their staff and the specialties on that staff? So we, they have roughly 75 to 80 staff members at any given time. Uh, they've got most of their staff are centralized out of uh, Texas, but there's a gal on our team that's on Long Island, one that's in Pennsylvania. So they're a couple hours away, which is not a problem. Um, you know, they're close enough to drive. Uh, they've got folks that are focused on, uh, they've got people that do the financial feasibility studies. They've got folks that do marketing. Uh, they've got folks that do, uh, they're focused on the construction side. Uh, they have folks that coordinate with interior design firms. Um, programmatic staff members that, so for example, if, um, if we decided, well, we know that we need more wellness space but we don't really know what that's defined as. They've got staff members that can tell you, okay, the current trends in CCRCs for wellness are you need to have a quiet meditative yoga space. You need to have a fitness center. You need to have a salon or spa. You know, we don't have that vision. They have that vision and can come to us and say, if you, if you can only afford to do three things, these are the three things that you need to do. What about a pickleball court? Oh, they, everybody says we need a pickleball court. <laughs> That's, that was pretty unanimous. So. Do, do they have many people with psychological, psychiatric kind of background? So they don't do, they don't do direct provision of services. They don't run communities. Um, so they may have someone on staff that has a degree in something in those services, but they're not providing us, you know, here's how you run a CCRC. They don't run CCRCs, they develop them. But the space affects the people's relations. Well, and, and that's, they, they take those things into account, certainly very adequately in terms of, so for example, one of the things that they focused on immediately when we were going on our tours was the very poor design or um, current use of our alcove spaces, okay? So those alcove spaces, if they were done correctly, would be much more inviting and encourage people to come out and spend time and socialize in those alcove spaces. Right now they hold puzzles for the most part and empty couches. So immediately all of their team members have said, there's so much we can do with these spaces with different seating elements and different types of, um, you know, how things are done to draw people out because they don't want to see the, the just the vacant spaces. So whether they have that, that specific background, I'm not sure, but they know this clientele and they understand that the socialization and the ease of, of things. So another thing that came up was, you know, the pub area that we have as designed now is not really, even if we had alcohol behind the bar, it's not inviting for a social pub setting. You know, so they cued in on that and said how important it is to have a place that people can come socialize and congregate, whether it's alcohol or juice, but just something that looks like it's intentional to invite a socialization. Our pub doesn't look like that. It was never designed that way. But we have a lot of space out in that patio. So if we were to expand that space and redesign it, there's a lot that could be done. So again, these are things that we will probably love, and we could probably figure them out if we needed to, but this is best left to the professionals because they just do senior living redesign and development. Thank you very much. You're welcome very much. Now, um, Rob, Betsy has a question, and I think we're gonna wrap up because it's 2.35, and I know folks have things to do. Go ahead, Betsy. At the Lost Village Planning Board, what happened? This is much more immediate. Yes. So the last Village Planning Board meeting was April 5th, 4th, 5th. Um, we were the first project on the agenda after they did their normal business. So it was myself, Tom, uh, one of our board members, Michael Zeeler, who used to be on the Village Planning Board and is now on our board. Um, 
and our engineer, so that's who represented Woodland Pond for any questions. The, the decisions that were made at that point, so the Village Planning Board has our application for the sixth cottage expansion. They have reviewed it. They, their next, the next steps that they gave us at that meeting was that the village engineer, who is Dennis Larios out of Kingston, Bernier and Larios, needed to confirm that the existing site plan provisions, which was approved back in 2006, are being honored by virtue of these cottages being built. So our engineer already determined that when they created the site plan for the six units, the village is requiring that Dennis Larios on behalf of the village planning board confirms it independently. So he's currently doing his independent review to ensure that the original site plan is being honored. Um, the, so that was one action item that we, we were given. The second one is we, in our initial application, we had included the different agencies that have to approve the project and they wanted us to include additionally the Department of Health and Department of Financial Services. Um, so we need to add those to the application that's already been completed. Um, I think those were the only action items. So the biggest thing was that we had to coordinate for Dennis Larios to come on site and do his confirmation that the existing site plan was being honored. And there is one particular board member um, that was not on the board at the time. She's on the planning board now, very environmentally conscious. Um, you know, she really wants Dennis Larios to say for anything related to the environment that was on that original site plan, we wanna make sure that it's being honored with this new plan. Um, and she kind of hammered on that a little bit talked about the critter crossings that are on George Danskin Way um, to make sure that they're intact and that they're, they're working correctly. Um, so this, Dennis Larios is definitely already working on it uh, because he's been asking us questions, Tom's been sending him data, so that's all underway. And so I'm not sure if we'll get on the next planning agenda or the one in two weeks, but at that point we should have our answers to those questions. Can you notify us on the next? Yes. Yes, we will notify you when all of the meetings are being held. They're every two weeks. We'll let you know if we're on the agenda. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. I hope you Thank had a nice day. Thank you very much for all that information today. You're very welcome. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good morning.